this lecture covers the CFA level 1 reading on markets in action. We'll start with a simple example that's given in the curriculum which basically uh, allows us to understand how markets respond to uh, external shock and the example is used of, uh, of an earthquake in Chicago. Before we get into the details of the example, let's just understand what economists mean by short-run supply and long-run supply in this context. When the city is hit by an earthquake, short-run supply refers to the number of houses and apartments. So basically we are talking about the supply of housing which is available immediately after the earthquake. So apartments that remain functional and operational immediately after the earthquake. Long run supply means the supply of housing units in the long run. So this gives uh, suppliers or construction companies sufficient time to build enough new apartments to meet the necessary demand. So in the context of apartment buildings in San Francisco, long run would mean probably one to two years, which gives enough time to build new housing uh, units. Equilibrium, as you have studied before, is determined by the intersection of demand and short run supply. So let's look at uh, supply and demand curves, which you are very familiar with right now and let's take the situation before the earthquake so before the earthquake this is a downward sloping demand curve and let's say this is d naught and the supply curve is s naught this is a short run supply and let's say that the long run supply is uh, elastic and it's given by this horizontal line and we'll discuss in a minute why the long run supply is completely elastic at the Pre-earthquake equilibrium, our quantity demanded, let's say, is 100,000 units and our uh, price is, let's say, $16 per unit. When the earthquake strikes the city, what will happen to demand? In this case, we will assume the demand stays the same. Let's say that, you know, uh, so that hardly, that, that nobody dies in the earthquake. But what happens is that lots of housing units are impacted and destroyed. So the supply of housing units will shift to the left. So the supply moves from S0 to S1. The supply has decreased. When the supply decreases, what happens to the equilibrium quantity and price? It moves to this point over here. At this point, the price will be higher, which is 20 and the quantity is lower let's say that the quantity is now 72,000 higher price lower quantity so this is our situation in the short run what is going to happen now let's say that the cost to developers the marginal cost of creating a new unit is $16 so if the marginal cost of creating a new unit is 16 what's the additional revenue that developers are getting the additional revenue that they are getting is equal to the price so the additional revenue is 20 since the revenue is more what is the incentive for builders the incentive is for them to start building so they start creating more housing units so let's move to the right what will happen in the long run so as so as so we are here at s1 which is simply this curve over here so as builders start building more housing units what will happen to the supply curve the supply curve starts slowly shifting to the right and it will keep shifting to the right until we end up back at uh, s0 and why is that because at this point our marginal revenue will again be equal to marginal cost. Remember the marginal cost as before was 16 and when we come back to the original point this is where the marginal revenue or the rent is 16. So in the long run the the quantity supplied so in the long run the price will come back to 16 
and that is why our long run supply curve is completely elastic and that point is illustrated here long run supply is perfectly elastic at rent equal to marginal cost which is 16 in our example now let's talk about some factors which create inefficiencies in the market the first factor that we will talk about is that of a uh, price ceiling so a price ceiling is where the government or some other regulatory authority imposes a maximum price a classic example of price ceiling often seen in large cities in the US is that of a rent ceiling where the city government might put a limit that for certain localities or certain buildings there is a ceiling or the or a maximum rent that can be charged so let's see how that impacts supply and demand now here is going back to the example in San Francisco so this is the post earthquake situation so in the post earthquake situation uh, you had an equilibrium of uh, quantity of if you recall 72 from the previous slide and a price of 20 the city government of San Francisco then decides to impose a rent ceiling back at 16 which was the price before the earthquake so this is our rent ceiling so when there is a rent ceiling look at what will happen so at a price of 16 what is the supply going to be so at a at a price of 16 the supply is going to be lower than 72 so let's say that the supply is going to be um, so let's say that at 16 the supply is uh, let's say 44,000 units now at 44,000 if only 44,000 units are supplied then how much are people willing to pay for those rental units to figure out how much people are willing to pay work up to the demand curve and let's say that the intersect over here is 24 so the issue is that we have a very limited number of of um, units 44 in this case people are willing to pay a lot more than what the ceiling has been set at so that's one point and the other point is at a price of 16 what's the demand so at a price of 16 the demand is way higher so the demand is up here let's say that this is you know 110 so we have created a huge shortage so at a price of 16 the supply is only 44 the demand at a price of 16 is 110 so an immense shortage has been created what does the rent ceiling uh, so so because of the rent, rent ceiling what will happen there will be a lot more search activity people will be running around trying to find a new apartment because of the shortage it might not be easy so if people are willing to pay up to $24 for a rental unit and if they find one they only need to pay 16 they would be willing to pay up to $8 per unit searching for a, for a housing unit so there will be search activity which is not efficient suppliers may discriminate so suppliers may just uh, you know, rent out to people they like which is again not necessarily efficient such a shortage will encourage bribes it will cause a reduction in quality because there is no incentive for suppliers to to improve quality and as already as has been discussed there will be lots of shortages so as you can see several issues with imposing a price ceiling in terms of the dead weight loss notice that this was the efficient point now if we have reduced the quantity to 44 this is the area that is being lost out completely so this is dead weight loss if the price is uh, 16 and quantity is 44 this green region here is the producer surplus the blue region assuming that consumers spend up to eight dollars just searching for a unit so those $8 potentially get used $8 times the quantity 
so this area is the amount that is lost due to looking for a house so lost from housing search and up here top left is the consumer surplus so assuming they rent a house for 16 and spend eight dollars looking for a house so overall expenditure was 24 then the only consumer surplus left is this region in blue on the top left price ceilings help create black markets black markets means that there is economic activity outside the legal system and typically black market prices will be higher than the ceiling prices set by the government as has been mentioned uh, renters might bribe landlords to to get access to scarce housing and it's also possible that landlords might follow the letter of the law but not the spirit by charging excessively for mailboxes keys etc so if somebody loses a key they might be charged five hundred dollars for a spare key or they might be charged a thousand dollars a month for uh, for a mailbox and 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 so on so basically by charging excessively for for things that renters expect and need landlords tend to make up for the artificially low price ceiling as you can imagine black markets are inefficient why are they inefficient three broad reasons that you need to be aware of any contracts made in a black market are not enforceable because obviously a legal contract cannot that is made a contract that's made in in, in a black market is cannot be taken to a court of law because in a black market people are breaking the law there is the risk of prosecution and this might cause landlords to charge even higher prices and obviously in a black market since there isn't uh, regulation since this is happening outside the legal system there is that's another reason for why quality might deteriorate now let's talk about a price flow a price flow where is a scenario where uh, the government sets a uh, some sort of a minimum price and a classic example of a price flow is a minimum wage so a minimum wage is where the government says that for a certain kind of labor typically unskilled labor there is let's say a minimum wage set of dollars 5 what happens when there is a price flow if the price floor is established above the equilibrium wage so in this example let's say the price floor is set over here so price floor is set over here without the price floor let's say that the equilibrium wage would have been four dollars so the equilibrium wage let's say would be four dollars and let's say that at a equilibrium wage of four dollars the quantity of labor is 21 million hours per year when the minimum wage is imposed at five dollars what is going to happen so at a wage of five now the demand for labor represented by this downward sloping demand curve so what will happen to the demand for labor this goes down so the demand for labor is now down to let's say 20 million um, hours per year of labor so the demand is down now at this lower quantity of 20 the providers of labor so this is unskilled labor they are let's say actually willing to work at a lower price so if they are willing to work for dollars three we have this situation what are the issues the major inefficiencies here one is excess supply of workers so so at a minimum wage of 5 the demand is 20 at this point what is the supply at a at a wage rate of $5 per hour the supply is much higher so let's say that the supplier might be the supply might be 22 million hours per year so this is the uh, so this is you know unemployment where you have a lot lots of people who want to work but the demand for labor is much less so that creates high unemployment so that's the uh, 
that's the major issue with uh, price floor and minimum wage now is there any dead weight loss since there is efficiency obviously there is dead weight loss as has been mentioned the efficient point would have been this point right here with quantity equal to 21 but we are stuck over here so all this region where the demand which represents the marginal benefit is higher than the cost or the mar than the marginal cost so this region is lost when we when we restrict ourselves to 20 so with this region lost this region is the is the dead weight loss so this whole region that has been shaded is dead weight loss what is this uh, region on the bottom left this region on the bottom left is basically like our uh, producer surplus or supplier surplus so this is the surplus for the uh, workers so workers are now uh, let's say workers are willing to work for three but when they do find a job they get five dollars so what does this yellow region represent this you can think of as uh, job search costs so these are search costs so workers are willing to spend a lot of time and energy looking for work so potentially if they are willing to spend up to two dollars an hour searching for work because they were willing to work for three if they do find a job they will get a job at five dollars an hour so they are willing to spend up to two dollars running around looking for a job so these are potential search costs when they do find a job they get five dollars so this region on the top left you can think of as the consumer surplus or in this case uh, actually this region in the in the top left is the consumer surplus with who's the consumer in this place in this context the consumer is the is the businessman or the factory that's employing the unskilled labor so this region is the employer surplus and the region on the bottom left is like the supplier surplus the supplier being the workers so the workers are going to get dollars three in this region they were working willing to work for less than three dollars so you can think of this as the the workers surplus earlier we've been calling this the supplier surplus but in this context the suppliers are the the suppliers of labor are the workers price floors what are long run effects you know as we've seen excess supply of goods so in the context of labor it's excess supply of labor there will be a substitution in consumption which is moves away from the price control good so if uh, we have a price floor on labor what uh, factory owners will try and do is substitute in capital rather than labor as i've already mentioned minimum wage is one example of a price floor excess supply of labor increases unemployment and procedures are instituted that try to substitute capital for labor already mentioned that non monetary non monetary benefits such as working conditions on job training will all decrease because uh, factory owners will feel that they are already paying more than what they should pay and hence they will cut back on non monetary benefits now we are going to look at the impact of taxes and how taxes create inefficiency as we move into this topic let's just first very quickly understand different kinds of taxes one basic kind of tax is income tax which is tax paid when you earn income social security tax is the tax that you pay when you are working and then that money is used on you later when you retire uh, to provide health services and and so on sales tax or value added tax is the tax on consumption so when you buy goods you potentially pay a sales tax this term is very important tax incidence so tax incidence talks about the division of the tax burden between a buyer and seller so if you have a two dollar sales tax and uh, let's say of this two dollars effectively a dollar fifty is paid by the consumer and fifty cents is paid by the supplier this division of 150 and 2 is called the tax incidence 
statutory incidence refers to legally who is obliged to or required to pay the taxes and actual incidence means who is actually going to pay the taxes and you will understand this distinction in the next slide so let's look at the tax on cigarettes in new york city before and this is a uh, this is an example of a sales tax that is imposed on suppliers so before the tax is imposed let's say that we have this regular downward sloping demand curve and we have a, 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 a and this demand curve is somewhat inelastic and we have supply curve s not before the tax is imposed so before the tax our quantity of uh, cigarettes sold let's say is 350 million packets and the price is three dollars per pack so this is pre-tax now the government wants to discourage cigarettes so they impose a tax equal to a dollar fifty per pack so if there is now a tax of a dollar fifty on the supplier so the statutory incidence is on the supplier what will happen to the supply curve the supply curve will shift and you have this new supply curve s tax the way you can think of it is you know in the past if at a quantity of 350 the supplier was charging three because there was no tax now with the tax of 150 at the same quantity the supplier will simply add the tax of 150 and charge four dollars fifty and basically one dollar fifty is added to each point on the supply curve so we effectively have the supply curve that is shifted up by 150 with the new supply curve represented by s tax what is the equilibrium price and quantity the new equilibrium price and quantity is given by this point over here let's call this point b the new quantity is lower which is what the government wants so the new quantity is 325 and the new price now is a higher which again is what the government wants so the new price is four dollars so the price that consumers pay is four and effectively what is the price that the suppliers get remember when the consumer pays four dollars per cigarette one dollar fifty goes away as taxes so how much does the supplier end up with so the supplier is only left with 250 so here is what's happening uh, originally the price of uh, of the cigarette is three dollars now for the consumer the price is four and the and for the supplier the money that he gets is 250 so effectively how much money how much more has the consumer paid per cigarette the consumer has paid one dollar more and effectively what's the loss to the supplier from three down to 250 the loss to the supplier is 50 cents so what is the actual incidence of taxation so the actual incidence is that for the dollar 150 tax the consumer pays dollar one so this is for the consumer and the supplier is effectively paying 50 cents so the incidence the actual incidence is that two-thirds of the tax is is borne by the consumer and one-third is borne by the supplier so that's the incidence of taxation now what happens if you have a more elastic demand curve as shown in the picture on the right actually let me just let me just finish this off so notice that in this case the the amount that is paid by the consumer is relatively high because we have a inelastic demand curve so that's the amount paid by the consumer this is the amount paid by the supplier so where is all this money going this money is going to the government in the form of taxes and have we created inefficiency yes we have created inefficiency because our efficient point would have been this point a over here but we are now at a lower quantity so this region is the dead weight loss shaded uh, gray and red so that's our dead weight loss okay a, a concept that you also must understand very well is what happens if our demand curve is less uh, is is uh, is more elastic 
so that's shown here on the left hand side when the demand curve is more elastic notice that the the amount of taxes or the incidence of taxation on the consumer so this is the taxation on the consumer this is on the supplier with a more elastic demand curve it is easier for consumers to move to a different product when the prices go higher so notice that in situation on the left versus the right on the right the incidence of taxation on the consumer becomes less and if you take this to the left and if the demand curve were completely elastic and if the demand curve were completely flat as shown here then what's the what's the incidence of taxation on the consumer then there is no tax effectively on the consumer and the supplier ends up paying the entire tax very important point and what i now want you to practice is the is is these four situations and just one little point to understand before you get into these the example that i just showed you was an example where we have demand supply and the supply curve was shifting upwards because the statutory incidence of taxation was on the supplier now if rules are such that the demand that the that the incidence of taxation or the the statutory incidence of taxation is on the consumer then what will happen in that case what is going to happen is the demand curve will shift to the left so if the tax is on buyers the demand curve shifts down or to the left as shown in this example over here so here is your exercise now so i want you to pause the video and look at the situation perfectly inelastic demand notice that the if the demand is perfectly inelastic vertical demand then the buyer pays the whole tax so do some uh, supply and demand curves and prove that if you have a perfectly elastic demand then the seller pays i just showed you that example if you have perfectly inelastic supply then the seller pays and if you have perfectly elastic supply then the buyer pays so again pause the video and practice this okay so welcome back now we will talk about the impact of a government subsidy what's a government subsidy a government subsidy is where is you can think of a uh, subsidy as the opposite of a tax so this is where the government is actually making a payment to a producer and this is most likely to encourage the production of 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 uh, a given commodity so here let's say the government wants to encourage peanuts the growth of peanuts so we have the demand for peanuts downward sloping as always and let's say that initially we have the supply curve s not and before any subsidy is introduced let's say that the quantity of peanuts in the market based on the uh, supply and demand intersect is 40 million and the price is also 40 when a subsidy is introduced so then the supply curve will shift downwards by the amount of the subsidy so if the subsidy is 20 dollars per ton the way you can think of this is if initially at a quantity of 40 the price is 40 dollars the the supplier is now simply getting 20 more dollars so they would be willing to sell for 20 dollars down here so that explains why the supply curve simply shifts down by 20 dollars so what's the new equilibrium the new equilibrium is now this point b over here and let's say that after the subsidy what happens to quantity the quantity goes up to 60 the price will fall so let's say that the price comes down to 30 and is there inefficiency the answer is yes there is inefficiency and it is measured by this region over here so this is a dead weight loss why is this a dead weight loss the reason is that this s not represents the actual cost to society it represents the marginal cost actually so this is the marginal cost the demand curve represents the marginal benefit so in this shaded region the marginal cost to society is more than the marginal benefit and since that's the case it, this is clearly inefficient 
so we have increased quantity but society is paying for it and hence this is inefficient the the fourth form and just as a quick recap we have so far talked about price ceilings price floors so those were caps above the equilibrium below the equilibrium we talked about the uh, we talked about a uh, subsidy which created a quantity greater than the equilibrium now the fourth and final uh, sort of uh, item which creates an inefficiency is a production quota so let's say we are talking about the sugar beet market and as always we have our regular demand curve supply curve before any quota or production quota is imposed let's say that our quantity sold is uh, the quantity in the, in the equilibrium quantity is 60 and the price is 30. now let's say the government succumbs to pressure from the sugar beet association and imposes a production quota of uh, of say 40 million tons so this is our new production quota what is going to happen here so with this production quota the supply uh, so at uh, at a quantity of 40 suppliers are willing to supply at a lower price of uh, let's say uh, so let's say at a price of 20 and what is the demand so people are willing to pay a much higher price so so let's say that uh, so people are willing to pay 50 so people are now willing to pay much more than the supply and if we are stuck at this point what is the inefficiency the inefficiency again is the dead weight loss or this region because in this region the benefit to society would have been more than the cost to society of producing additional units of sugar beet so this is our dead weight loss uh, bottom line is that production quotas uh, create a inefficiency which is obviously bad for society the final slide in this reading is uh, just shows how how taxation and penalties can be used to fight the war against drugs again let's go to new york and let's say that we have a major problem with illegal drugs and in this illegal market let's say that this black downward sloping line represents a demand curve and this line over here represents a supply curve before any penalties are imposed now the government decides to tackle this problem and the first thing that they do is they impose huge penalties on suppliers of drugs so what will happen to the supply curve if the suppliers of drugs are worried about being caught and being uh, fined what is going to happen to the supply curve it will shift up or shift to the left and this new supply curve is s plus the cost of breaking the law so if the cost of breaking the law is very high the supply curve will shift a lot if the cost of breaking the law is low then the supply curve will not shift too much so if there is purely this cost to suppliers then the new equilibrium point will move from e to f which is good because the government has successfully managed to reduce the quantity but now the government wants to move further what can they do they can now also impose a very high penalty on the consumers so if a high penalty is imposed on consumers what will happen to the demand curve the demand curve will shift to the left and what's our new equilibrium quantity the new equilibrium quantity is represented by this point h so from f to h the price goes lower but that's not such a big deal because the main point was to reduce quantity so by imposing a fine both on suppliers as well as consumers the government has managed to reduce the quantity from this point at e down to h which was the intent so that's it in terms of this uh, presentation and uh, as always i want you to practice as many problems as you can